And welcome to Education, Leadership, and Beyond, Surviving and Thriving. My name is Andrew Murata, host of the show. It is show number 80, and once again, super pumped to be back on. We are live on Facebook. We are headed to iTunes. We're live on Voice Ed Radio, and uh, happy to announce we are going on Disrupt Ed TV. Uh, excited to join that great group from New Jersey. Uh, who will be broadcasting uh, education, leadership, and beyond on their network. So very excited to join Disrupt Ed TV and all the great work that they are doing. Thanks so much for tuning in. Excited today's guest. I've had an opportunity to get to meet and know over the past couple of years, uh, Eric Schininger. Eric is doing great work in education. Uh, when he was at New Milford High School in New Jersey, did some tremendous work. And uh, now he is on the national platform, the international platform, uh, making great impacts on school. And we're going to talk to Eric about all of his work, all of his books. Um, and Eric has been a friend to Port Jervis here in New York and many schools around the country, uh, impacting them and helping their leaders, helping them implement great practices in their schools. So we are live on Facebook. If you are watching, uh, please leave us a question or a comment. Uh, and Eric and I will try to get that in on the show uh, to be able to interact with our guests. So we'll bring Eric on in just a couple of minutes. So when I first heard Eric talk, he told the story about how he was anti-social media when he was a principal in terms of banning phones and, and banning social media use and kind of saw it as a negative light. And I was watching that saying, oh, my God, like I felt the same way. You know, I felt the same uh, kind of thing. I did not have social media uh, in my first few years of being an educational leader, and uh, uh, it wasn't something that I saw as an educational tool. I just didn't see it that way. Uh, my wife and I did not want it. Uh, we didn't want people peering in on our life, and I had a paradigm shift along the way. When I, when I uh, wrote my book there and uh, kind of used social media as a platform to connect with people to get uh, the story of my book out, uh, the principle of surviving and thriving, I, I turned it around. And I also met some educators that were using social media to benefit schools, to help tell their story. And I heard Eric tell that story and I was like, wow, that's unbelievable. And not only did Eric change his mindset about social media, he totally dove in and saw the benefits of it for his school and, and beyond and began to use social media as a way to share out the great things that are going on uh, in his school and, and develop a, a PLN, a personal learning network, and all of the great things that come with social media. Uh, and that's just one component of his work. But I was a school leader that was not using social media to help benefit our schools, to help, you know, learn personally for myself you know, meeting educators on social media. Eric's very active on social media right now as a leader in that area. And uh, I, uh, uh, you know, learned a lot from Eric. I've learned a lot from my personal learning network. So I wanted to share that story as an opening. If you're an educator and you're not on social media, now is the time. And maybe after today's show, it'll motivate you to, to get involved. If you are, um, on social media, certainly follow Eric Schininger uh, and, and, and the concepts that he's going to talk about today. Uh, but use social media to celebrate your school and certainly your own personal development. So if you are watching live, again, leave us a question. My number one listener I see is watching. Hey, mom. My mom is watching, Eric. She's in Staten Island. And uh, I always enjoy mom being on the program. Thank you. That being said, let's introduce Eric and let's bring him on the program. Here he is, uh, live from New Jersey. Eric, welcome to Education, Leadership, and Beyond. Thanks for having me, Andrew. And uh, hi, Mom. I lived in Staten Island for 13 years with my wife. That's where <laughs> I'm from. So uh, love uh, coming on to SI. The, the Rock. You paid that toll many a night. <laughs> yeah, too many. That's right. Uh, folks, this is Eric Schininger. Eric is a, a national and international speaker. 
He's an innovation leader. Uh, he is certainly an educator through and through. Um, he's a former high school principal at New Milford High School in New Jersey, and he is now a senior fellow with the International Center for Leadership in Education. Eric, that's a lot right there that you, you're doing. Welcome to the show. Yeah, thanks for having me. The irony here is before social media, my bio was like a, a couple words, not even barely a sentence. And it's just amazing uh, the journey that I've gone on thanks to being able to connect with hundreds of thousands of people across the world. And Eric, you are connecting with schools and, and uh, companies and, and educators around the world now. Tell me about this journey you're on right now uh, as, you've, as you've left New Milford. Uh, you've moved your family to Texas. And uh, tell me about this journey you're on with uh, ICLE. Yeah, I kind of took a leap of faith. And um, what I'm doing now, I wasn't trained to do. I had no aspirations to be a speaker, presenter, author. These were all unintended consequences of taking a critical lens to our work at New Milford High School and analyzing where we were, where we were in order to formulate a plan to get to where we wanted to be and where our kids needed us to be. And in the process, you know, whether it was improving achievement, implementing a whole array of innovative uh, strategies uh, in, uh, in ways that led to actually definitive results and evidence, you know, this opportunity then arose, this opportunity at the International Center arose because they were one of many organizations and schools that visited us new, at New Milford High School to see firsthand you know, not just to hear what we were saying, but to see in person what we were doing. And, you know, I, I guess my way to sum it up is that the strategies, the ideas had substance. And now I'm tasked with, you know, working with a team of consultants, a, a team of thought leaders to help schools, districts, organizations take the critical lens to their work and celebrate what they do well, but more importantly, think about what they have to do better. Think about how they're gonna grow. Thinking about accountability, thinking about how, what, you know, qualitative and quantitative measures they use to determine success. And, you know, we talked about it all about how I'm and all these things were so foreign to me, to me. To me. but I just wanna make it clear, this was not my goal. This was not my intention. I am a byproduct of an amazing staff amazing staff, amazing students, amazing supports that through a distributed leadership model, we were to we were able to accomplish great things for our kids. And now just being in like today, I was coaching in schools on day two of three here in New Jersey, just being able to work in the trenches, to implement the ideas, to roll up my sleeves, to not just, you know, let people learn from me, but in turn, I am learning so much by what actually works, thanks to this position where I'm in schools uh, almost weekly. And Eric, who, who directs that work to you? When you show up at a school district, is a, is a district meeting with you saying, Eric, we want to improve our attendance, or Eric, we want to improve our technology. Who directs the work for you when you arrive at a school district? Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's a whole variety of different people. It could be central office, building leadership, or even teacher leadership, or even outside committees. But the whole idea is this, you know, the, you know, my job is to leave people with more questions than answers. And before that, it, it's kind of, you know, hitting, uh, I don't want to say pain points, but kind of asking the tough questions that get us to really take that lens to our work and think about, you know, what does the research tell us? What does our evidence tell us? How do we know that our innovative ideas that are new and better are actually leading to uh, improved results? You know, what evidence do we have to show that teaching, learning, and leadership is actually changing? And, and what's ironic is a lot of the work, you know, sometimes I might go in for a digital implementation and might make the determination that the school or districts isn't even there yet. So we're working on just good old fashioned pedagogy grounded in the research that we're all familiar with. But you know, the premise is this, Andrew, there is no perfection in education. There's no perfect teacher, administrator, school, district, state, or organization. Knowing that education is an amazing profession because we have the opportunity every single day to get better. Sometimes it's taking the blinders off. We are often blinded by our own bias. At other times, 
you know, I hope to be a cat catalyst to move schools away from the most dangerous phrase in education. That's the way we've always done. Mm. Now, I'm not saying throw out the, throw out the baby with the bathwater. I'm not saying that. If something's worked in the past and it's grounded to research and we know it leads to results, do it. But there are many practices in schools, in districts that just do not benefit our learners today. And my job is to help guide. I don't tell people what to do. That's not my job. No speaker, no consultant should tell a district or school what to do because we don't know the culture. We don't know you. We don't know the people. Our job is to get schools and districts to ask those tough questions and for, serve as a facilitator to move the culture in a better direction for kids. Eric, when you were at New Milford and this opportunity arose, how did you know it was the right thing to do? How did you know I can do this? Uh, I'm going to change what I'm doing in my school and, and, and travel around the country, travel around the world, uh, move my family to Texas. Now, that's a big decision. That's a big leap of faith. How did you know it was the right move? I didn't know. And, and I think every day we should always question our decisions because that's the at the heart of reflection. You know, John Dewey said we don't learn from experience. We learn when we reflect on experience. And I'm constantly reflecting. And I mean, it's hard to determine if it's the best or the right decision. You know, I was very fortunate to have a, a, such a support structure at home. You know, mainly my, my wife, um, my, my, my parents, my in-laws, my kids, you know, and, you know, my heart said, you know, that, you know what, I think we were on something at New Milford. You know, we were able to, you know, we were not the most innovative school. We were not the highest achieving school. We were better than most at showing evidence of how our ideas and strategies led to better results. And, you know, when you think about motivation, you think about passion, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, but I mean, if you're passionate about the work, you know what, people better get out of your way. And I, and I think that's what I try to exude in what I do is I'm so passionate with, again, trying to be that bridge to ideas, trying to get people to see that, yeah, we're doing great things in education, but we can always be better. I, you know, thinking about, you know, you know, would we want to learn under the same conditions as our kids? Would we want to learn in the same classrooms? You know, how do we know kids are learning? You know, so, and that's the core part of our work that really resonated uh, with me at New Milford was the work at ICLE, you know, focusing on the three R's, relationships, relevance, and rigor. You know, relationships are the bedrock, you know, without trust, there's no relationship. If there's no relationship, no real learning occurs. Relevance. Kids should be able to articulate why they're learning what they're learning, how they will use it outside of school, and what they actually learned. Relevance is the purpose of learning. And finally, rigor. Rigor is thinking. And when we put it all down, we could say whatever, talk about the jargon, the buzzwords, but it comes down to two questions. Are our kids thinking? And how are they applying their thinking? And that really forms the foundation of the work that we were doing at New Milford that I get to do now. So coming back full circle, was it the, the best decision? You know, I, I, I think it was a good decision uh, for me and for my family. But what I really hoped about, it's not about me or my family. I hope that it was a good decision for those schools and districts and organizations that I have the honor of partnering with to help try to influence, support their transformation efforts. Eric, we're going to talk about your, your books here. And Mark Barnes is, uh, is talking about this book, saying a lot of the concepts you're talking about right now, uh, you shared in here with your co-author, Thomas C. Uh, Murray. And uh, Mark Barnes is, is, is complimenting your work. So, Mark, thanks for uh, tuning in. And uh, again, if you have a question for Eric uh, or I, please put it on there. Um, well, Mark, Eric, Mark, Mark Barnes is a trailblazer in his own right. What he's been able to do in part to disrupt the publishing industry, I have such respect for him. The mutual respect is there. And that's what's great about social media, Andrew. And I'm sorry to cut you off, is that yeah. you know the world becomes such a smaller place. And we're able to have ideas. We're able to have critical dialogue. 
provide feedback and push each other to be better. So I appreciate that uh, that Mark is here with us. And now I will not be rude and let you get back. To you, <laughs> nah, this is a this is a conversation with two guys from Staten Island. That's the way they do it there. You got to get the word in. But along those lines, Eric, you heard my opening concept about that shift uh, of social media. Tell me about that that paradigm shift and and how that happened to you in school. And obviously, we know where it took you. Well, you know what? I'm a big proponent of, you know, don't tell others what to do if you have not or will not do it yourself. And when it came to social media, I, I was that problem. You know, I was the fixed mindset. I said, no way, no how. And because of my views, that's kind of, you know, we kind of had a, sh a shutdown mentality in my school and district. You know, I didn't value it, so why should others? If you don't value it as a leader, don't expect your teachers or those who work with you, or your students or anyone else to value it. And, you know, one of my aha moments uh, was when I read a newspaper article in the Staten Island Advance. See, Andrew, <laughs> everything comes back to Staten Island. <laughs> as I was reading an article where I used to live in, the Travis section of Staten Island, you know, I'm reading his articles because it was so dumb. And I'm like, you know what? The people that use social media, they're losers. I don't have time. <laughs> oh my goodness. I can't fit in social media with my adult league softball, with my commitments to my wife, my kids, my friends. I didn't see value. So I'm like, yeah, you know what? The article was so dumb. I was enamored by it. But when I got to the end of the article, the light bulb went on. I finally saw a connection to my professional practice, and that was communication. You will not find an effective leader who is not an effective communicator. That is the only reason why I got on social media, to be a better communicator. And you can look at the research time and time again. It talks about how important communication is. So then I'm communicating, and then I got creepy. And there's a lot of creepy people out there. There's creepy people probably watching right now. There's a lot of creepy people on social media because they did what I did. They lurk. They have social media accounts, but they don't actively engage. They lurk. I lurked and learned. I learned how far behind my school was. I learned that my school and myself, we weren't very relevant. I learned that I had a long way to go to become a better leader. I learned how to unlearn and relearn, moving from a fixed mindset to a growth mindset, to be more open to not just new ideas, but to really place a lot of credence and effort in showing, not telling, showing how our changes were dramatically improving culture. And that was my journey. And here we are today. Doing great things on social media and in schools. Uh, and again, if you're watching live, please leave us a comment or a question. Uh, and Eric, that's a great story uh, for educators uh, having that growth mindset and just the, having that venue of social media to learn from one another. And, and like you said, it opened up so many things for you. Eric, another thing that you're doing a lot of and, and doing well is writing books. Uh, and I'm very curious about that. You have a number of books that you've written and uh, co-authored with. You know, tell me your... And this is pretty much common knowledge when I, I present is that you know I was not trained at all to be a public speaker or a writer. Those are two things that I was not very good at. But you develop, you know, these skills and competencies when you're very passionate about something and when you get to uh, talk and implement it. So I am my mother, uh, who's in Florida right now. She's also my parents are from New Jersey, but they're in Florida. Snowbird. Is she, is she watching the show? No, but I think my mother-in-law might be on right now. <laughs> okay. So, um, mom, if you're on, hi. But yeah. uh, my mom in, in Florida, she has she insists that she proofs all my blog posts because she got so tired of all the grammatical errors in my blog posts because I got so excited. I'm like, I got to share it now. Uh, patience is not a virtue sometimes with me. But so, you know, I think now with books is I have great editors and I've also been blessed to write with um, some amazing co-authors. You noted before, Tom Murray one of my very good friends, and we push each other to be better. You know, I, I think that I'm not as – my strength is in writing. I think my strength is trying to link the ideas, practical approaches, uh, and research together to present a compelling case for the why, 
the how and the what when it comes to change. So, you know, I was solicited to write my first book on social media. I never met my co-authors until the the book was done. And we I met Bill Ferreter, co-author on my first book in the airport to sign the contract. Wow. And then I mean, the ideas that we implemented in New Milford, other people found valuable and what was pretty darn cool was that publishers were coming to me. I mean, I never thought I would write a book. I never planned on writing a book. And it was humbling, but a lot of pressure. So, you know, I, I think writing is kind of a manifestation of your personality, your passion, your interests. And everyone has different writing styles. There, there's no one way or wrong way to write a book. Uh, it's about finding your unique style, finding your voice. And the real challenge today is writing on a topic uh, that either has not been written on, very hard by the way, or writing on a topic in a way that is uniquely different. Um, and that's a lot of the advice I get. People ask me all the time, you know, how to become a writer, how to become a speaker. And it's very hard for me to answer that because my uh, route to this life was so unconventional. Well, you were doing it. You were doing the successful things in the school, and now you're really just sharing it and talking about it with others, like you said. So you have the background that you did the work and now are sharing. Yeah, I mean, and, and now I get a lot of uh, inspiration from being in trenches. You know, you know, the job embedded coaching is probably one of the most fulfilling things that I do. And the work that I've done at Wells Elementary in Cypress, Texas, that's the, do the school that my daughter went to last year. Such an amazing school. And, and I'm in there multiple times during the year. But you know what? It's so inspiring. These teachers love feedback. They implement the feedback. It's probably one of the best examples of blended learning. You know, there's a big difference between blended learning and blended instruction. Blended instruction is what the teacher does with tech. Not saying that's bad. But blended learning is where kids use tech to control path, pace, and place. This school at Wells is a blended learning campus flexible learning spaces, no homework, bring your own technology, and utilizing Google Classroom and um, Seesaw as a means of portfolio-based assessment. Not only do they have the evidence of how pedagogy has changed, but the first year they were tested, 97% proficient or higher across the board, grades three through five. Fifth grade, my daughter's class, 99% proficient or higher. Wow. So you know, I, I feel that in the coaching now that I'm here doing in Mount Olive uh, Township, New Jersey, it's just amazing being able to be a sounding board for leaders, having you know, go, been a, a practicing principal, being a practicing teacher, going through all the reforms. You know, Now we're Common Core, now we're not Common Core, and all this stuff. And just having conversations and being able to offer not the best, but hopefully some practical strategies to help move districts forward. And that's the key. When we talk about professional learning, professional development, I feel, has been something that's always been done to us. Professional learning is something we want to be a part of. Professional learning, the research has shown, the most effective professional learning is job embedded and ongoing. And I think that's the part that I love the most about the position I have now with ICLE. And you get an opportunity to be in your kid's school and You've shared those pictures and you've shared the stories about Texas when you do speak. But Eric, for someone that was working in, in North Jersey, right, and, and Staten Island and that grit and all of that, was it a culture shock for you to, to, to go to Houston? And, and, and tell me what that transition was like landing in another place and and walking into a school in Texas with this guy from well, New York. That's well, like well, New York. well, I'm not from New York. My well, wife is. New I'm Jersey. From, yeah, you know. I'm from northwestern New Jersey. My school had 400 kids, my high school. I went to a K-8 consolidated school in very rural New Jersey. And, yes, there are rural parts of New Jersey. We are the Garden State after all. You know, I, I think, you know, I mean, we live now in a globally connected world. I wouldn't say it was much a shock moving to – uh, Houston, or even going places now that I've been blessed to travel in the world, around the world, you know, it, it, it's a lot of it is, you know, I did my digital, I did my research, you know, I, I did a digital audit of the district that we eventually selected, Cypress Fairbanks. You know, we moved to Texas for a reason. 
well, my wife wanted no more snow. She got sick of shoveling snow when I was working all over the world, like in Hawaii. I made a mistake taking a picture. Well, now I'm in Texas. And, um, you know, I wouldn't say it's a shock, but I think what's interesting is not just the fact of moving to Texas, but now the fact of having worked in almost every state in schools in the country, seeing similarities to challenges. Uh, looking at successes, trying to find those commonalities, that common ground, and and really focusing on, you know, many schools across the country where we look at urban, suburban, or rural, they have the same challenges. And the best part is how schools are overcoming these challenges. There's so much evidence out there of success. It's how do we tell those stories? How do we share those stories? How do we provide, again, that job embedded ongoing professional learning support? How do we get more books out there that help support educators and teachers uh, in the trenches? And um, how do we keep using technology to connect with not just regions around the country, but around the world to expose our learners and educators to the best ideas, the practical ideas, but different ways of, uh, ad- uh, of uh, overcoming a problem to, identif- uh, to develop a solution. Eric, it's amazing the work you're doing in schools and, and yeah, Texas, New Jersey, uh, kids are kids and, and schools are schools and you're, you're, you're in all of them. How about yourself, Eric? Right. You, you went from a lifestyle of going to a school every day, getting in your car, driving to school, the same routine, the same coffee mug, all of that kind of stuff. And now you're all over the country. Right. And you're you're bringing your A game each and every day. How do you continue to sharpen the saw personally and take care of your own wellness on the road? Uh, you know, your wife's not packing sandwiches for you every day to keep you healthy here. How, how are you maintaining that uh, le- leading the lifestyle you are? Yeah, you know. I think at any job, you know, listen, the principalship, the superintendency, I, that can wear away at you. I mean, it is endless hours sometimes. You know, I remember as a principal, I, I was leaving Staten Island at 4.45 a.m. to drive up to Bergen County, New Jersey. I was getting home 7, 8 o'clock at night. You know, I, I look at this grind as a little, little different. And whether we're teachers, administrators, or people like me now that, have I mean I, I all my flights were canceled on Sunday because of the snow. I got on one flight, then I had to drive through a snowstorm to get here. The school was on a two-hour delay yesterday, and so you know I I think you have to keep yourself mentally sharp and and physically. So you know I, I make a commitment to work out every day when I'm on the road. I mean, and I, I try not to make any excuses unless I'm deathly sick. Um, I watch what I eat. Except uh, in the evenings, I'm not going to lie, we all have our vices. Mine is craft beer. And uh, I, 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 again, I try to watch what I eat so I can do that. But I also constantly reading. I'm, I'm trying to engage. You know, I look at part of me in terms of keeping my balance is doing things like this. You know, giving time to share, uh, I wouldn't say the knowledge and wisdom I have, but my point of view. And people can agree with it, disagree with it, that's fine. But as long as we have these conversations, but I I think finding that work-life balance, you know, one thing I've gotten a lot better of is on the weekends, when I'm home, I'm home. You know, I'm much better at disconnecting to a certain point. Um, When I get home on Wednesday, I'll be working all day Thursday, but then the kids and I are going to see Captain Marvel. I made sure we got the tickets to see it before I go to Spain for a bunch of days. So finding that work-life balance Trying to stay mentally sharp, uh, keeping up with you know being healthy, I, I think are so important for anyone that in any role, whether they travel or not. Yeah. So you worked at a school today, Mount Olive, New Jersey. You're in a hotel right now, uh, and we appreciate you sharing some time with me. You know, you tell me your tell me your routine tonight. You're going to go exercise when we're done here. You do it in the morning, and <laughs> and and do you order out? Do you, do you uh, go out to a local place by yourself? How to, tell me about your routine tonight. I, here's my point. Uh, uh, my thing is, I'm a morning person. If if it doesn't get done in the morning, then I make up all the excuses as to why it can't happen. And I think that's just with anything, whether it's professional or personal. So, I already did my workout. Um, and after we're done, I will probably go and, uh, finish up my blog post that I'm working on. People think, again, I'm a gifted writer to blog. I spend a week writing my post. I start Sunday 
and hopefully I'm done by Friday. It, it doesn't come easy to me. So I'll finish that up. I might do a vlog. Uh, I'm using Periscope a lot to do live, unscripted, raw reflections um, based on some of the thoughts and ideas. And then usually life on the road is pretty lonely. But uh, tonight I'll be meeting up with a local superintendent, uh, as I mentioned, to have a craft beer or two, dinner, and then I will probably be in bed by 930. Ready to go again tomorrow. Yes. We're That's, right. Try. <laughs> That's right. Eric, uh, again, directing your work and, and the, the message that you're bringing out, I, I know you're going to be one of the main presenters at the National Principals Conference this summer in Boston. Uh, I saw you on there. Who directs that traffic for you? And when you go there, you know, are you crafting that message? Do you already have it? How do you decide what you're going to present uh, at, say, the National Principals Conference? Yeah, and I think there's a bigger issue there is I, I cannot overstate the importance of people sharing their work. You know, you might think an idea is eh, but someone else could think it's amazing. We don't really have a lot of confidence per se, and, and sometimes we don't want to open ourselves up to criticism or scrutiny, but there are so many great things happening, so many great ideas that, you know, Half the battle is getting that out there, being consistent, sharing it through text, through pictures, through video, or through blogs. So when I look at a conference, whether it's NASSP this summer, I'm going to be at ASCD um, in a little over a week. And a lot of those opportunities come about being consistent uh, with sharing my thoughts, You know, whether it be my blog, uh, books, doing things like this. So I'd say the books kind of set the foundation for what I'm going to talk about. And, you know, I, I, like ASCD, I submit proposals just like everybody else. Other conferences, they're like, hey, Eric, what would you like to present on? And, um, you know, I'm in a position now where I, I can make those decisions. So, you know, what for me, though, is I, I try to not to be a one-trick pony. And, again, you know, I have, I think, 13 different presentations, six different keynotes, I'm always trying to get a pulse, uh, both uh, tech and non-tech, of what the major issues and challenges are out there. And uh, I do have a new edition of Digital Leadership that's coming out in a few months. I'm so totally proud of this because I looked at my writing back in 2014, and I'm like, oh my God, I've grown a lot. And been able to totally revamp a book in a way that's evergreen, meaning less focus on tools and more focus on leadership dispositions colored images, discussion questions built in. And um, now I am uh, formulating my next book project, which will not be a technology or innovation book. I mean, it's going to be a, a, a real, raw, hardcore look at pedagogy, which is what I am most passionate about. So, you know, all those things help lead to an interest or ideas that can be pitched to conferences and organizations uh, to present. And that's the key is staying fresh. You can take ideas that you've written about before, but but how do you, I don't want to say repackage them, but enhance them. And a lot of the ideas, are, a lot of ideas that are floated around now are not new. They're not. Very little is new. What's new is all the tech we have and research on how the brain works. So a lot of it is how we enhance and maybe show better approaches to implementing what we know already works. And that's what I think conferences are looking for. Yeah. Well, and Eric, like you mentioned earlier, you know, you don't have any formal training in speaking or formal training in writing. But when you present, you have people's attention. And uh, I'm looking forward to this summer in Boston. And, and uh, I know you're going to come back to Port Jervis and do some work. Eric, you mentioned about leadership uh, in the new book uh, that you have some, uh, you know, components of leadership in there. And I mean, like you said, you have so many different talks and about pedagogy and, and school design uh, and redesign. But when you go into a school and, you know, what are some things that you are seeing in the leaders of those really successful schools? What are those leaders doing in those schools that you say, aha, that's one of the components here that I see working. This principal is doing this. I like that. You know, because you're seeing it all. You're seeing a different school uh, multiple times a week. You're going to be in Spain on Friday. You're going to see different types of leadership and people. What skills are you seeing in the most successful leaders in the, in the successful schools that you're in? 
you know, the most success I think is how the leaders help build a collaborative culture. And that culture really focuses on this. Don't prepare kids for something, prepare kids for anything. I'd say the most effective leaders are those that have implemented a bold vision by building capacity through delegation, through consensus, by empowering their teachers and their insistence to be the change that they wish to see. You know, the most effective leaders are the ones that are more or less invisible. You know, when you look at the work of, when I look at the work of this, the most successful schools that uh, I've been blessed to work with, it's driven by the teachers, it's driven by the kids. So those leaders that create a culture of risk taking, that remove the fear of failure, that believe in accountability, not accountability to fire or an I got gotcha, you, but accountability to grow and get better. The most effective leaders thrive on feedback mechanisms. You know, they look at the research and know that feedback has to be timely. It has to be specific. It has to be a dialogue, not a monologue. It has to be, you know, something they could use right away. Um, and, you know, the teachers that are constantly giving that feedback in order to improve and, and also, you know, the ones that can go in and conduct a formal observation and guide a conversation that really gets a teacher to reflect on what they're doing, but begin the process of implementing agreed upon changes that are going to improve the culture for kids, you know. And, and I think, you know, there's different types of leaders, so you can't group them all, you know, in, in one boat. But, you know, here in Mount Olive Township, the superintendent is Robert Zawicki. You know, he has an amazing vision and he is new in this district. But what I appreciate uh, from him is how he really is, you know, uh, sort of ushering in an innovative spirit here in this district. You know, I go back to looking at, you know, Cheryl Fisher at, uh, Cypress Fairbanks and at Wells Elementary and how she really just builds capacity amongst her team and lets her teachers lead the charge. You know, I, I saw, you know, a, another leader I've respect for, uh, Brad Curry, you know, a fellow New Jerseyan who was an early adopter here in New Jersey and, you know, really has led by example. So, you know, it's tough to say what the best are doing because best is arbitrary. But I'd say the more effective leaders, you know, they build capacity in others. They communicate effectively. They understand that leadership is a team effort. It's not about one person. They understand that one person or one idea is not going to change a the system. They leverage uh, research and evidence to move change efforts forward. They get in classrooms more. They provide that really good feedback. They ask questions such as, how is assessment changing? How is student work changing? Uh, how is unit design changed? How is level questioning changed? So they ask the right questions and in turn get others to ask the right questions. So there's a lot of qualities I could say. And there's a lot of amazing, amazing leaders out there that I can't say all their names because I don't get in trouble for not saying uh, missing them. <laughs> But you can go on social media and find a lot of those people. Yeah, the people you're following and your friend Brad Curry is watching. And, and thank you for the shout out. Eric, that might be your next book there about what you just said about leadership in schools, because that was fantastic. I, I, I ran out of paper to write. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> my, my next book is how to help other administrators and, and uh, speakers get through airport security in a timely fashion. <laughs> hey, Brad, you know I'm talking about you. <laughs> Eric, this is fantastic. Um, you are making great impacts in schools around the country and around the world. But if you were the guy making the rules, if you were the Secretary of Education or one of the people in the White House that is putting the pen on paper with, with some of these educational laws, what would be one or two things that you would say, absolutely, we need this right now? What would you, what would you say to that? Pay our teachers more. Elevate the profession, celebrate our teachers, our administrators, raise the profession to a level of prestige that gives our teachers and administrators the credit they deserve. You know, so many great things happen in 
our schools. And it is just a travesty that people in elective government who have never been educators do not understand what goes on in classrooms. So, you know, I, I think paying our teachers what they're due, respecting and elevating the profession are two of the most important things that we could do. You know, we need to inspire our kids to want to become educators. We need the best and brightest to want to go serve a greater purpose. You know, we have amazing, amazing people in our schools that are dedicating their lives to kids. But the fact remains that because of how the, the profession has de been devalued, you know, not many people, their first choice isn't want to become an educator. We need to change that. And, you know, and I think, you know, I, I have to push back on you saying that I'm making an impact. I, I don't look at it that way. I'm, I'm fortunate enough to be the guide on the side, to work as a coach, to help inspire and build capacity in others. And they're the ones that are having the impact, you know, so if their impact can be, you know, correlated back to what I have done, then yeah, you can say I'm having an impact. But, you know, when I look at, you know, the potential of education, you know, my father was a principal for many, many years at the same school. My mom was a first grade teacher. My grandmother was a first grade teacher. And I'm wow. the only one of my brothers to go in education, even though I originally did not. You know, it, it really is the most noblest profession. And I can't say and thank educators enough the teachers, the administrators, the aides, the bus drivers, the custodians. I can't thank every educator enough for the work that they do and the impact that they're having on kids every single day. That was a great answer, Eric. And I just read that about uh, someone from Finland uh, about the, the Finnish system that they said they, they pay their teachers just like doctors and lawyers. And that's how the profession is treated there. That's true. And again, we can learn a lot from countries like Finland. And, you know, they, when, when you talk about prestige in the profession, there is no other country that does it better than Finland by elevating the profession. Yeah. And, um, you know, but there is no perfect system, but we can take the elements that are effective and mold them into a system that works better for our kids. What works better for our kids is taking care of our teachers and our administrators. Amen to that. That's a great answer. Eric, we're running out of time here in the Northeast. We're going to, we're going to put some Staten Island traffic on you. We're going to go rapid fire. Okay. You ready? I'm ready. All right. Last book you read. The last book I read, I got to be honest, was <laughs> going through the uh, edits of Digital Leadership. So, okay. you know, Your book. Uh, Your book. but before that, it was uh, Daring Greatly by Breen Brown. Last movie you saw. I know you're going one Thursday, you said. Oh, well, thanks to being in Texas, I visit my movie room a lot. Uh, I just watched the new Robin Hood reboot. And before that, uh, on Thursday, my son and I watched. Uh, Mortal Engines. Even though it tanked in the theaters, I found it enjoyable. Shininger giving it the two thumbs up. Favorite place to travel? Oh my goodness. Anywhere with my wife. I mean, I, I travel a lot. It's not the same when you're not with your spouse. So um, we both love visiting uh, Hawaii. Mm. I, I think I saw one of my friends, Jensen Ball from Hawaii, on here earlier. Uh, we love going to Hawaii, and I also love going to Australia. I have so many great friends there, and I hope one day to take my my wife there because uh, I've been there many times. But uh, those are two places I enjoy. I love Dubai too. I mean, Dubai in the Middle East is just an amazing city. Yeah, something that motivates you, uh, Eric. My kids, my kids, the hope, um, the passion I see in them. And, you know, um, I look at them and uh, I, I think of other kids. And, and I mean, you know, every kid has greatness hidden inside him or her. It's a job of an educator to help them unleash that greatness. And, and I think that's what really motivated me to go into education, what motivates me now. Yeah. And you've shared the story of, of your children and their journeys and, you know, specifically your son about how he was bored and unengaged in school and, and, you talked about those things and, and and the work that the teachers are doing to find the the right the right way for him and what works for him. Yeah, well, I mean, it's he still struggles with that. Yeah. Um, but my daughter last year as a fifth grader, thanks to Wells Elementary, had the most amazing amazing learning experience ever. 
best best purchase under a hundred dollars that has had the greatest impact on your life? Oh my goodness, under a hundred dollars. Um, <laughs> I, I love my Roku. I, I, okay, I love, my, I love my Roku stick, and it lets me watch my TV outside. It's great. Cool. A pet peeve of yours is. <laughs> I got a lot, but in terms of <laughs> education, yeah. it, it's the people that uh, can talk about all the great ideas, but not show what it actually looks like in practice. And it's a pet peeve of mine because, you know, in positions like mine now, we can't just tell people what to do. We need to take them where they need to be. That's leadership. And it's yeah. not focusing just on the why it's really rolling up our sleeves and showing the how. Great answer. Biggest difference you see between New Yorkers and New Jerseyans and Texas? Oh, my goodness. Well, I'd say the – I don't want to get you in trouble. I know. You're going to get me in trouble. But <laughs> and, uh, I have a preference to the food in New York and New Jersey, although Texas has the best barbecue. Sorry to all the other states out there, but brisket in Texas is number one. You know, when you look at food, I'd have to give seafood a little bit more of a preference to New Jersey because of our expense, uh, expansive coastline. Um, but New York, when you think about Italian food, I'm still hard pressed to find better Italian anywhere than on Staten Island. Nice. Going back to the rock. Eric, you're being successful in so many areas. You know, what's been a challenge for you, you know, personally or professionally, that's been a hurdle um, or, or something that has been a challenge? You know, I, I think the challenge is more um, what I place on myself. You know, staying relevant, I think, is a challenge for everybody, whether you're a teacher, principal, or in the role that I am right now. So, you know, I, I think staying up to date with the changes in pedagogy, the changes in research, the changes in technology. You know, if we, you know, it's hard to prepare kids for the future if we're stuck in the past. So I think the challenge for all of us is adapting to this world that's very disruptive, remembering our training, and really being able to evolve in ways that uh, better impact whether it's our learners, or in my case, the educators that I work with. Awesome. Eric, um, you speak a lot. You're speaking in, in keynotes and different things. Most important qualities of a great speaker? Uh, again, uh, this is all through the lens of who's doing the speaking. For me, it's a mix of emotion and practicality. And I think that great speakers understand how the brain works. Uh, during an emotionally charged event, the brain releases dopamine, making it easier to remember. So good speakers try to get people to laugh and cry. Sometimes that comes at the expense of substance. And I think that it's an emotional, it should be an emotional roller coaster, but also have that practical link, that substance something that people can use tomorrow, regardless of the position that's going to improve their practice. That's aligned to research and just laid it in evidence that it actually works. Short-term personal goal, three to five months for Eric Schininger. Get started on my next and maybe last book. Last? No way. I do it right. It could be my last. Remember yeah. the challenges I said, coming up with stuff that's new yeah. and adapting stuff that's already out there. I'm a realist, Andrew. Okay. Long-term personal goal, three to five years. Oh, my goodness. Three to five years? Heck, I'm trying to keep up with what's going to happen in three to five minutes. Um, <laughs> you know, three to five years, you know, my, my kids will uh, – well, my son will be in college. And I think in three to five years, my goal is to do everything I can to ensure that my kids are on a path to success, that they're independent, that they can self-manage, that they're effective participators, independent inquirers, that they're really prepared for this disruptive world. You know, for me personally, I don't have a crystal ball. 
Um, I do, um, and again, in three to five years, if all goes to plan for me professionally, uh, I will have my doctor, my doctoral degree. So that is one professional goal. Very cool. Very cool. I'm right, right alongside you. Eric, you're on social media. You know, what would be the best way to people to, to follow you and, and get in touch with you? Well, a simple Google search will come up with all of my different avenues to connect with me. You know, whether it's Twitter, I'm at E underscore Scheninger. My website, ericscheninger.com, has everything, all my social media links. I'm on everything. You know, you can tweet, LinkedIn, Facebook, pin, Vox, email. You can even send me a voice message using Google Voice, whatever floats your boat. He's connected. He's definitely the connected leader. Uh, Eric, you said a lot of great things. Uh, and in your in your book here, that the one I, I most recently read, um, you know, there's a lot of great stuff in here. You know, how about a quote, something that is one of yours, your all time favorites uh, uh, to end with a quote? Oh, I kind of said most of them already. All the quotes I said are kind of in there already. Yeah. But, you know, I, I'd say that one of the main concepts, I'm not going to say a quote, but I'm going to take a, a concept that we present in that book. And it's key number three, which is return on instruction. We invest so much money and time in technology, professional development, and innovative ideas. That return on instruction is how is all that time, money, uh, spent actually improving outcomes for our kids what evidence is there what return is there on instruction that leads to improved learning for our kids so that i think is the most important aspect in the book because we want to be successful we don't want to throw as many things up on the wall we don't want to go get just you know feel so great after a, a keynote and then get into a classroom or a school and say oh my goodness this isn't going to work this isn't going to change outcomes so that return on instruction, I think, is the most important aspect in Learning Transformed. Great work here, uh, Eric Schininger. Eric, I really appreciate you squeezing us in, uh, all the work you're doing and, and traveling. Uh, you know, very impressive. And you, you, you push back on the word impact, but just know you are having a positive impact, certainly on school leaders uh, and all the work that you're doing in school. So I, I thank you very much and, and, and for joining us here on Education Leadership and Beyond. Well, thanks for having me, Andrew. All right. Safe travels. Enjoy that trip to Spain. And uh, uh, that next school, they better have some nice craft beer for you uh, <laughs> at, at, in the district for you. Exactly. All right. We are going to sign off uh, here with Eric Schininger, uh, speaker, innovator. Eric, uh, keep up the great work. And, and again, thanks so much for coming on. My pleasure. All right. Safe travels. Eric Schininger, everyone. Wrong button there, there we go.